welcome all of you to our program for problems with Lyme, Lyme disease and other so tick-borne illnesses. Um, uh, my name is Carol Gay, and I'm a member of the Southboro Open Land Foundation, and I'm also on their program committee. We have a number of other board members who are here from the Open Land Foundation, which is also known as SOLF. And if they could just raise their hands so people would know who they are. These are members of our board. There are a number of them around. If you have any questions about the Open Land Foundation afterwards, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to help you with answering those. We also have a uh, brochures about our organizations up on the table with the refreshments so that you won't miss them. Um, I want to thank also the Board of Health for co-sponsoring this event with us. And um, since our former governor, Patrick, declared Lyme disease as a public health issue as of 2011. Um, the members, there are a couple of members in attendance here. And um, let's see, we have Dr. Faison and we have Paul Kaczynski, right? And um, so they'll, they'll be around afterwards too. Now the Southboro Open Land Foundation preserves open land for the plant and animal life within. Therefore, we need to be aware of some of the wildlife that can affect our health so, and do anything, everything that we can to protect ourselves. If we're protected, we can then enjoy the beauty of our properties and we can also receive the wonderful health benefits from exploring natural places, either in South, South Borough or anywhere else but being protected is really important. While walking on our, our trails or anyone else's trails or volunteering, because land trusts do need volunteers in a natural place, you must be cognizant of the poison ivy one and the possibility of ticks. By hearing about the experiences of our speaker, Sandra Bonzani, mm -hmm. okay, um, we hope you'll be more diligent about protecting yourself from the ticks, whether you're on someone else's property or your own property. To tell you a little bit about Sandra, she is a member of the Acton Garden Club and the Middlesex Tick Task Force. I oh, got it. <laughs> she won the Lenore, Laura Wilmore rather, Conservation Award for her exhibit in 2010 at the Boston Flower Show. Um, that exhibit has also been displayed at many events in Acton, where she is from, and it, al it also has been displayed at the Tower Hill Flower Show and the 2014 Boston Flower Show. Sandra has attended medical conferences on tick-borne diseases and at the International Line an Associated Disease Society and the Lyme Disease Association. We will hear about her journey and what she has learned about tick-borne diseases. If you ever suspect one of these diseases for yourself, then perhaps some of the information that you receive tonight will be helpful. But you are the only one who can decide with your doctors at what, as to what is the right path for you to follow for your personal health. Remember, prevention may possibly save you from one of these, from a journey like she is going to be describing. <coughs> and I want to thank you for attending the program, and we'll just have to keep an eye on our watches to remember to end by 8.30. I hope you were able to help yourself to some water and desserts beforehand, and uh, we thank the library for allowing us to have the program here too. Sarah, we welcome, Sandra rather, we welcome you to South Borough. <laughs> well, hi. So, um, for the first time in 30 years, there were deer droppings in my yard, and I was hospitalized with the typical symptoms of bullseye rash, fever, fatigue. But they treated me for cellulitis. Uh, the NP wanted to send me home after two days and sign papers at 5 a.m. in the morning, but I knew that the rash had spread beyond the circle that was drawn on my back and I still didn't feel well, so I ended up staying for three more days. I saw my doctor a week later and my tests were positive and she treated me with two more weeks of, doc well, I didn't have doxycycline in the hospital. So at that point she treated me with two weeks of doxycycline. 
I tell you this story because I could have gone home and not gotten enough treatment. I didn't go out in my shady garden too much that summer because really I was afraid to. After having five days of IV antibiotics, I wasn't anxious to repeat that. So this began my journey into the world of Lyme disease. I've had Lyme since and a short burst of chronic Lyme. And for me, that was pain on one side of my neck. I wondered if I was getting a little arthritis and then it migrated, then I had it on the other side. Migrating pain is one of the signs sometimes of Lyme disease. Um, and then I um, couldn't hold a pen sometimes. So I knew then it was getting in my central nervous system. So at that point, I had I knew enough um, that I needed to go back and um, get more treatment. And my doctor uh, gave me two more. I had already been having treatment in August for a month. And this was November when this came back again. And I went back and had two more months of oral uh, doxycycline. But she said she would put in a PICC line if I still had symptoms, which luckily I didn't. So. Oh, wait a minute, we're out of order here. What happened? Hmm. Well, that's never happened. I'm going to escape and start again here. Let's see. There. So the following March, I went to a talk by um, Patricia Hug Huckery. Yes, I'll try. Um, just raise your hand if you don't hear me, and I'll shout more. Um, from mass conservation and wildlife and fisheries, who said in our area we had 35 deer per square mile. We should have five to eight. She said that in 2004, Nantucket called the state and said they needed help with the um, deer, ticks, and Lyme disease. They were inundated. They usually get things before we get them on the mainland. So they set up a lottery and uh, helped the hunters um, hunt over there and help them figure out how to get the deer back over here. Um, she said that was great, but they should have had them continue it for four to five years um, in a row because obviously the deer um, multiplied and so then did ticks and Lyme disease. So um, we know that hunting works and some towns are allowing more of it on conservation lands. Um, there is also concern that the deer are starving and we just, I just heard someone speak uh, last month about the deer and the snow. And they said that with all this snow, we probably will have a number of them die. But we'll have a lot of ticks because they like the moisture of the snow. So be prepared for this spring. Um, of course, the deer are also causing a lot of um, car accidents. And uh, the, as part of that Middlesex Tick Task Force, which I'll talk about, um, there was a conservation person that went out to their town um, in Carlisle and they um, looked at their conservation property and there are different ways that they um, figure out how many deer they have. They look at the invasive um, plants there because the deer don't eat the invasives. And um, they look to see what the nesting um, sites are or sleeping sites and um, they um, then determine they have 30 to 60 deer per square mile. So right now, the state spends $60,000 on um, mosquito control and nothing on uh, ticks. So then the town of Harvard showed the award-winning documentary film Under Our Skin in May and had speakers afterwards. Well, I was pretty shocked because I really didn't know anything about chronic Lyme disease. I kept reporting back to my garden club what I was learning, and a member suggested a petition for more education in town. So we gathered about 400 signatures and went to our um, board of selectmen who agreed, they all know about Lyme disease and tick-borne illness, and they sent us to the Board of Health who are now able to do up to four programs a year. Um, and a second follow-up film has just been released called Emergence. Most libraries have these films. If they don't, um, you can order them or you can see them on Hulu.com for free, on demand, or on Netflix. So in 2010, our club had a flower show. Um, our president and I built an educational exhibit. She knew how to do it. I hate doing those things, but I had the information at that time. So um, people asked us to leave it up in the library. Um, 
and actually the librarian wasn't that excited about it. She thought we could leave it up for about four more days, so then we took it down. Of course, the following summer, one of her employees' sons was very sick, had had chronic Lyme for a long time, and so she decided it could now be up there for about three or four months, so that's what we do every summer in town. Um, this is a picture of the exhibit, and it actually has won um, a number of, of ribbons. So we took it on the road to the Farmer's Market, Oktoberfest, Discovery Museum, the Wellness Clinic, Town Hall, the Library, and the Boston Flower Show last year. So. Um, Raise your hand if you have had a tick-borne illness or know someone who has. Take a look around you. Maybe you know this already. Yeah, it's epidemic. So you can see from this map how much the New England area is affected. And this has happened as our lands have become reforested and there's less clearing of land for fuel and agriculture. And as Carol mentioned, Governor Patrick declared Massachusetts in a health crisis due to Lyme disease in June 2011. This slide shows that there were over 30,000 reported cases in Massachusetts over 10 years. In 2013, the CDC reported that there were more than 300,000 cases a year um, in the U.S. Every state has tick-borne disease except Hawaii. The numbers are much greater than breast cancer and HIV AIDS. Um, you should always remember to um, report your tick infection to your town or to your board of health um, and make sure your doctor does. I know when I was in the hospital, I didn't know that I was supposed to report it. Um, and someone asked me when I was saying I had been sick, oh, didn't you report that? And I said, no. So I tried to get in touch with the doctor, found out it was the doctor at the hospital that would have to report it, and they don't like doing all the paperwork sometimes, so I couldn't get them to do it. And then I called my town, and the nurse there said that she would go ahead and get it for me. Um, so I just figured I wanted to be counted as a case because people need to know the numbers. However, if you go to the doctor and you're not tested, um, you know, and you just get treated, um, there's no record of that. So we know that the numbers really are higher than, than what I'm telling you. Um, so ticks are everywhere. And here um, is the tick identification card. There's some up in the front if you didn't get one. So the nymphs and the females are the ones that can give you tick-borne illness. Um, the, um, or, or, you know, any bacteria. And they can give you multiple um, diseases with one bite. So the tick on the right of the um, underneath the tick ID card is the female with the red on her back and then of course way to the left is the nymph. Um, here's an erythema migraines rash or bullseye. This is only present less than 50 percent of the time so you can't count on having that rash or any other kind of rash. There are different rashes that you can get. Often um, the other types of rashes are if you have had the infection for a longer period of time, but not necessarily. There is really not very much that's definitive about this disease. Um, so, and here's the, uh, the female to the left. And you can see on the top row there, way to the right, that's the engorged deer tick. And below that is the engorged um, dog tick. And some ticks have been found to, some dog ticks have been found to carry the Borrelia bacteria now, which is a little frightening. Um, here's the size of a female tick um, on a finger. Ticks have a two-year life cycle. A white-footed mouse is the primary vector, but chipmunk squirrels and now some birds are also carrying the bacteria. So that changes it because now they're finding that um, some of the ticks are dropping out of trees. They always used to be, you know, on tall grass um, and you'd brush against it and that's how it would get on you. But now people have said they've been sitting under trees and they've actually had them falling on them. Um, so um, the April and May, the nymphs need their first blood meal. Uh, in August and September, the adults need one. And each adult can lay up to 2,000 eggs to start the next two-year life cycle again. Um, the adult ticks need a large host, and 95% of the time it is from a deer. So that's how the deer fit into that. So the ticks are out. 
uh, mostly during the warmer months, as you can see. Um, although I know I had a tick on me one December, I had been out picking up sticks on a warmer day after some storms and went out to dinner that night and someone said to me, oh, what's that little thing, black thing in your hair? And it was a tick. Of course, with my hair, you could see it. But I, I probably would have gone to bed. I would have gone to bed that night and not known it. Um, deer ticks can be present, um, you know, anytime it's above 32 to 34 degrees. So as soon as you're out there and we start finally getting some grass, be careful. Um, I actually check myself now all seasons, often in front of the mirror at night so I can see my back. Um, and I actually feel because um, you can't see the little ones. We describe them too as freckles sometimes, they're so tiny. Um, so dogs bring ticks into the house. 60 to 80 percent of the dogs get Lyme disease, even with the vaccine. They're treated with doxycycline like people. Cats clean themselves unless they're older or lazy. Because I thought, because I thought they never really would, you know, get Lyme, but apparently they do now and then. Um, but they bring the ticks into the house. So never, ever, ever sleep with your animals. As much as you love them, it's a bad choice. <laughs> um, walk them on a leash on trails in the woods and away from the tall grasses where the ticks hang out waiting for a blood meal. Um, my neighbors pretty much walk them on the street now in my neighborhood. Um, there is a vaccine for dogs, but as I said, they often get Lyme anyway. There was a vaccine for humans, but it was taken off the market. They thought people were either getting arthritis or possibly Lyme disease. They are working on another vaccine, but it's still a ways off. So um, this is the spirochete, Lyme borreliosis. It is a cousin to syphilis, corkscrew shape. That might sort of help explain why it's so difficult to, um, to treat. It can cause fever, headache, fatigue, and a characteristic skin rash, and if left untreated, can spread to the joints, the heart, and the nervous system. See that little dot moving up there and now changing into a spirochetal form? So before, um, when it came up in a circle, that's called the cyst form, and I'll explain more about that, but it's important. Um, so it can spread to the joints, heart, and the nervous system. Um, and um, because, well, I sort of said that already. So anyway, it becomes chronic when it becomes <laughs> cyst-like. Um, the cell life of the spirochete is 28 to 32 days. So stopping treatment shy of a full life cycle often proves ineffective. Um, and I have another slide that will demonstrate that. Um, Eva Sappy, who is an ILADS member and researcher, showed that bacteria can become cyst-like in one to two days in mice. That was pretty shocking because, um, you know, I hope that that isn't happening that fast in us. They don't know yet. And you know that ice man that was discovered a number of years ago? Um, when they looked at his tissue, he actually had the Borrelia um, in his system. Well, they know that this has existed for a long time, but um, we kind of are in the, uh, the perfect storm, I call it, where we are not agricultural anymore. We're forested and we're shady and we're moist, and that's what ticks love. So Lyme um, can be the great imitator. People can have similar symptoms to MS, Parkinson's, ALS, ADHD, and the bacteria has also been found in Alzheimer's brain, brains and in the placenta. Um, if you see the film Under Our Skin, Dr. Alan McDonald um, is a pathologist. He's now retired. He um, was doing work in his basement on his own, bought himself his own microscope. He was trying to prove that Lyme disease uh, or the Borrelia was, this disease was chronic. It was very difficult to keep the spirochete alive, apparently. But he finally showed that there, were, um, there was a biofilm, and I'll show you more about that. So um, since we know that the tests are only about 50% accurate, um, some um, 
uh, where it's endemic here in the Northeast, that often people will insist on three to four weeks of doxycycline if bitten, um, and amoxicillin for children under 12. Um, I have heard others suggest asking the doctor to record a refusal to treat um, if they were, you know, not getting help. Um, and because the state of affair of um, tick-borne illnesses is so up in the air like HIV AIDS was, um, people are getting very sick. And you don't want to be one of those that gets sick without getting enough treatment. So it's suggested you get copies of your lab reports in case you need to take them to a different doctor. So deer ticks are carriers of Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases such as um, babesiosis, and that is malaria-like. It requires a separate test and separate medication like you would have for malaria. Uh, the Red Cross now has a test for it um, before you can give blood. Um, once you have babesiosis, you can never give blood again. And there's no definitive such test for Lyme. Um, someone told me um, that, you know, you call the Red Cross, and, um, and so I did this because I, I was kind of shocked because you don't know if you still have Lyme. There's no test to know if it's really left your system for good. Uh, the person at the Red Cross, I said, well, what if, what if I have had Lyme disease? And he kept repeating to me, they tell, give him a line, if you don't have symptoms right now, you may give blood. So, you know, they're working on a test, but they don't have one yet. So someone came to the Boston Flower Show when I was there for five days. I never sat down because people had so many questions. And this one man came up to me and he said there were 200 cases of babesiosis on the Cape that summer. He was one of them. It was in 2013, I guess. And uh, he, um, that was the first time I'd, I'd heard those numbers, but I know that uh, New York State has a lot of cases and it's increasing. Um, so, um, so with Lyme, when they, with antibiotic treatment, some of the spirochetes are killed, but others hide until they can activate again in a four week cycle. So that's why it's difficult to get rid of it and know what the story is if you have it or not. Um, anaplasmosis slash ehrlichiosis is treated with two weeks of doxycycline. So you're covered if you're also being treated for Lyme. Um, and that's that, that and babesiosis, those two are um, two of the more prevalent ones in our area now. Um, but you don't want to know how many are coming down the pike. I remember when I first went to our farmer's market, the, uh, the woman that was in charge was doing research on ticks at Mass General. And she said, you don't want to know. But I said, just tell me. And she said, well, at that time, it was probably like they had 100, you know, different, different tick-borne diseases. They weren't named, but they were looking at that. So this isn't going away, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and then there's Bartonella. And sometimes it's called cat scratch fever. Most often, there are neurological symptoms. It is one of the hardest ones to treat. Tularemia is endemic now on Martha's Vineyard. Um, it attacks the respiratory system. And we usually get the diseases that they have there, and they come here. Um, they actually um, surveyed all the landscapers there and were surprised that it was so endemic already. Um, tularemia and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever are two of the ones that come from a dog tick. Um, so Rocky Mountain, well, we're starting to see Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but not that much yet. Um, Powassan is a virus. The transmission from the tick can be within 15 minutes. In December of 2013, uh, they actually had this paper in the, or this article in the Globe. It was about a woman in Maine who was diagnosed with meningitis. And um, she was a gardener and a photographer. She had about 12 acres of property and she didn't know, they didn't know what was the matter with her. She died. They did an autopsy on her body and found that um, she had this Powassan virus. 
There is no treatment for it, only supportive care. And Massachusetts has kept a list of these cases. There aren't that many, um, but there are a number of um, states that had not been keeping um, track of it, so I guess they will be keeping track now a little bit more. Um, so, oh, um, Mia Modi. Uh, it's Borrelia Mia Modi. Um, it was recently added to the list of diseases in 2013. It looks like Lyme, acts like Lyme, but it's not Lyme. German scientists warn that unlike the Lyme disease spirochete, B. myomodi appears to be readily passed between generations of ticks, which means the transmission goes directly from the infected egg to the larvae, which means you don't need a vector. So that could mean that every one of those eggs that the tick um, lays is infected. So that's, that's another game changer there. And we're seeing more of that, um, more Miyamoto here. Um, and then I'm just going to mention, I didn't add it here yet, but this, um, there's a lone star tick that is spreading from southeastern United States. Um, it injects the sugar into the bloodstream that causes a rash, itching, and severe swelling of the tongue and throat after you eat red meat. I don't know if you saw this, but this was also in the paper a while ago. Um, from 2009 to 2012, the number of cases jumped from a few dozen to thousands. We're not seeing too much of it here, but um, I've been told that it's, um, some of those ticks are coming up here. So there's three forms of um, the Borrelia uh, bacteria. The, um, the first one there is the spirochete, that's the cell wall form, corkscrew-shaped um, Lyme bacteria, and that's how it first enters your body. Um, and then there's the cystic S or L form, and you can see the little balls there and then the, that line. Um, that's when it um, becomes cyst-like and hides in your cells. And then the third way is the intracellular location. It penetrates the cell wall that includes the cytoplasm and the nucleus. I'm sorry, but I don't have a lot of good things to say. I will have a lot of things you could try to do, but you, <laughs> there's nothing too good about this at all. Um, so here's the biofilms. They're always found in chronic diseases and doctors agree that if you have a biofilm it is a chronic disease and that's why it was so important to, for um, Dr. McDonald to show this. When I went to the ILADS convention in 2012 uh, he was the speaker first thing on Sunday morning and actually everyone in that room got up and clapped for him. Um, yeah. I'm going to explain that, oh, okay. what it is, yeah. Um, but, um, and of course, nobody had done that for the three days, you know, that I'd been there. And actually, I was lucky to go. I found out that I could volunteer and, and host uh, some things, and then I could go to the talk. So that was like going to my rock star concert, because <laughs> I've been doing this stuff for a while, and I was really thrilled to be able to hear these people speak. So, um, a biofilm is a collection of microscopic organisms which have chosen to attach themselves to each other in the interest of survival. Biofilms can be found all over the world. You're hosting a few yourself. In fact, in the lining of your intestine and your teeth. Biofilms are also responsible for that weird gunk on slippery rocks in a river and streaks of algae um, that you sometimes see on a pond. A biofilm is characterized by the sticky adhesive substance which members of the colony secrete. And this substance becomes a supportive matrix um, pulling the colonists together and protecting them from the outer world. It's making them stronger. And as it grows, sometimes they get so big that they have to separate and start a new um, colony. So. Uh, in that film, Dr. McDonald, uh, Under Our Skin, Dr. McDonald was given 10 Alzheimer's brains from Harvard, and he um, found the Borrelia bacteria in seven of them. So they're wondering if there's a connection between Alzheimer's and this also. 
We don't know. Uh, when he spoke that day, he's retired, he said uh, he's hoping to live long enough to show that that's true. So we'll see. Um, and of course, when it, when it has gone uh, in Bartonella and in, um, in Lyme disease, um, when you have neurological symptoms, it shows that it's bro broken the blood-brain barrier which is usually difficult for um, diseases, you know, and various bacteria to do. So um, this research confirms persistent bacteria. Um, in addition to the known phenomena what, by which bacteria achieve resistance to antibiotics through mutation, there are other types of bacteria known as persistent bacteria which are not resistant to antibiotics, but they simply continue to exist in a dormant state while exposed to the antibacterial treatment. These bacteria later awaken when that treatment's over, resuming their detrimental tasks. So this is what happens why it isn't always killed. They're hiding out, but they're calling it um, persistent bacteria. So prevention is key. I'm going to have a sip. So you can use DEET on your skin, permethrin on clothing by spraying them on the ground and letting them dry. Permethrin kills, DEET repels. So if somebody's really you know, in the woods a lot, or if your yard is, is bad, or you're hiking and you're worried about the ticks, you're better off either spraying clothing, or you can buy clothing that's already treated, or you can send your clothing in to be treated. Um, if you spray it yourself, the permethrin um, percentage is usually less than if you have it done, but it can go through a number of washings. Um, However you have it done, whether you spray it or order it, it tells you how many it can go through. Um, I have a question. Is it yep. true that the permethrin is bad for cats? It's a chemical. You really wouldn't want them licking it. No. I, you know, that's, um, I'm going to talk about tick tubes that they use um, also as a deterrent, and you wouldn't want dogs eating that, so I assume it's the same for cats. Um, so um, protecting yourself. If you, uh, when you come in, um, you should be um, stripping. Um, putting those clothes in a bag and seal it, in a, not on a rug in case there are ticks on your clothing, but a place where you can see them on a kitchen floor, a basement, on the porch or something. Um, and um, you, you, um, the tick, let me just say first, the tick bites are usually painless because the ticks inject an anesthesia before it bites you. So not only are they small, but they're doing that so you don't even know they're on you. Um, and they don't actually have um, a head or a mouth. They have kind of like two daggers. I mean, they're made for this, um, the, you know, and they just go right in. Um, so that's why it's important to do your full body check and check your children and your, your uh, pets. So before you go out, you know, here's a man with uh, duct tape on his wrists and, and his ankles. Um, I don't know that everyone's going to do that all the time, but you should always at least not wear open-toed shoes Tuck your pants into your socks because you're keeping at least the ticks on the ground from getting up. Um, but if you're in the woods, you might want to at least duct tape your socks there. Um, it's good now to wear a hat um, also and long sleeves. And light colored clothing um, because you can see the ticks more easily on you. And never put those clothes back on. Um, so when you come inside, Somebody asked me, can I put the clothes in the washing machine first? Well, you might be leaving the ticks in the washing machine. So, you know, you're probably wearing old clothes when you're out in the garden or you're hiking. 
So just take them off and put them in the dryer for um, 20 minutes. I have an hour it, um, on my, oh, it's on the exhibit, an hour. That's what they were saying even a few years ago. And actually, um, so it's down to 20 minutes, but it could be even less because um, there's a, this was in the Globe too. There was a Quincy uh, girl who was doing a biology project and she ordered ticks and she was putting them in the dryer to see how long it would take to kill them. And so her results were only five minutes. Well, apparently the CDC heard about her study and they said now that they were going to do their own study. And, you know, it would be easier if we could shorten the dryer time. Anything we can make easier is terrific. Um, so anyway, you know, you can shower, but you might not do that every time, but it's a good idea. Um, and check yourself thoroughly. Don't go to bed that night. It just gets to be your habit, unfortunately. It's another thing like brushing your teeth. So, um, here, is, is there a tick on you? Um, check anywhere dark and moist. Check your hairline in your ears and behind them. Back of the neck, your armpits, groin, legs, behind your knees, and sometimes between your toes. Um, you look for new freckles. Um, so if you find a tick, um, tweezers work. Um, there are all kinds of different, you know, tick, tick release equipment that you see out there if you Google it and look online. Um, but what's important is not to use Vaseline or matches. Don't squeeze the tick because you're irritating him and he might squirt more bacteria into you. Pull the tick up slowly with the tweezers close to your skin. You get it under there. Um, I remember doing one once on my thigh. And, you know, I'm, I've been doing this for, I mean, I haven't taken that many ticks off me, but, you know, I thought, oh, okay, so I'm going to do this. My husband said, well, you want me to do it? I said, no, I want to do it. And so I got those tweezers, and I'm pulling up. And I'll tell you, I was trying to go slow so I didn't irritate him, but I could feel his little legs hanging on in there. And he hadn't been there very long. I mean, he wasn't bloated or anything, but, and it hurt. Um, it did hurt a little bit. So it's not something to necessarily look forward to. Um, you don't have to worry about leaving the head in. I know originally I went to the doctor because I wasn't sure if I should have the head out or not, but they're saying now that that really isn't um, going to hurt you anymore. Just make sure you thoroughly clean it with a little soap and water, um, put a little bacitracin on it and a Band-Aid for a day or two and you know, you'll be okay. Um, but it doesn't necessarily take 24 to 48 hours to pass the bacteria into you. It can be quicker and really no one has shown by a study exactly how long it does take. So, um, we don't know. So here's a list of Lyme disease symptoms. And you can see, I have a list at, on the table too that you can take, but you can Google this. And it's very varied. And um, it, that's why it's so difficult to even know if, if you have it. Um, can you see it? You want me to read some? You can see it? No? So fatigue. Low-grade fevers, hot flashes, chills, night sweats, sore throat, swollen glands, stiff neck, migrating stiffness, um, myalgia, chest pain, palpitations. There is cardiac uh, Lyme. Um, abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, back pain, sleep disturbance, uh, poor concentration, memory loss, irritability, mood swings, depression, blurred vision, and eye pain. I actually was at the, um, the eye doctor the other day, and I knew that sometimes doctors can um, diagnose Lyme through the eye if, you, if it goes to your eye. But I didn't know exactly how, so um, I, knew, I didn't know that this particular office was doing it. So I asked them yesterday, and he said, uh, yeah, it can be like uveitis or um, retinitis. And um, he says, every ophthalmologist should know about this. I hope they do, because I don't know. Um, jaw pain, tinnitus, you know, the ringing in your ear. 
vertigo, cranial nerve disturbance, that facial numbness, that's a classic sign sometimes that people have sort of a Bell's palsy on one side, uh, numbness, um, optic neuritis, headache, lightheadedness, dizziness. So. Um, so when you go to have a test, they usually get the ELISA test first and then the Western blot test. Neither of them are more than 50% accurate, unfortunately. Um, and they're not testing for the bacteria itself. Um, they're testing for the protein that's being formed in reaction to the bacteria. And so that's why it's a little more difficult to get a good test. Um, within the first three, two to four weeks, you probably would test negative because there hasn't, there hasn't been enough time for that bacteria to form, so the proteins can't read it. Proteins are part of your immune system. Then after that, there could be a period where you're positive. And then if you become chronic, you may test negative after that. It depends. Everybody's different. Um, sometimes with people who have been chronic, and I didn't understand this for a while, um, if you've been chronic for a while and, and you've been testing negative and someone starts treatment, then they may test positive. And the reason for that is because your immune system is able to start functioning again. And so it can maybe read that, um, those proteins. So um, IGENEX is considered a controversial lab by the Infectious Disease Society. Um, however, they are FDA approved. They actually have two of the proteins that were taken out of the regular lab tests when they were developing the vaccine back in 2004 or 5. Um, OSPA and OSPB. I don't know why they haven't been put back into our regular labs, but they were always positive for Lyme disease. So, um, I don't know if they're saving it because they're going to develop another vaccine or, or how that's working, but it's a shame. Um, so a lot of Lyme literate doctors send their labs to IGENEX because, because they have those two bands. Actually, I'll show you another slide um, about the, the testing. I'll wait. I don't want to be there. Oh, here. Uh, so here's the CDC versus Igenix Western blot test. So the CDC requires five bands out of the following ten bands, and they're listed there. Um, Igenix requires two of the following six bands. And you can see in there they have the OSPA and the OSPB, which are 31K and, and 34K. Um, Then there's combination treatment therapies. Um, these are different drugs that you would use for cell wall form, cystic form, intracellular um, form or location. Um, they're not easy drugs. No one really wants to take them. On the other hand, you don't really want to be sick. But you need a doctor who's familiar with treating that. Oh, and I did just want to say that, um, so as of August 2014, the CDC is recommending that only FDA-approved laboratories can do tests for Lyme and tick-borne diseases. Well, right away you think, well, that makes sense, you know, we like things FDA-approved. But there's sort of a catch-22 in that the labs have to prove that they know how to do these tests and then they can get FDA approval. So we don't really know how this is going to work out, but it may put more pressure on, on other labs to be able to test people. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is that um, right now, um, if a doctor orders only an ELISA test and that's negative, 
then they will not do a Western blot unless you tell your doctor that you want it done. Um, sometimes they would order both anyway, but they're not doing that now. So it makes it harder to get a correct diagnosis because you might be one of the ones that test positive for these. Um, so these are the, um, my thing is skipping here. Here, safeguarding your yard. Um, see that brown area that kind of goes around the edge of the, the picture over there? Um, that um, is a border of mulch or stone that people often put between their grass and their wooded area because ticks, remember, like it shady and moist. They don't like it dry and sunny. Um, they love stone walls, wood piles, and brush. You can upbranch your trees. Don't put children's swings under those trees anymore. Put them in a little bit more sun. Um, you um, keep your grass mowed, remove your brush, and the wood piles. The ticks love it there. Limit ground covers like Pachysandra. I happen to have a lot of it. Um, so it's not good, <laughs> I find out later. Um, use plants that don't attract the deer and zero scaping for less humidity in your yard. Discourage the rodents and put the bird feeders away from the house if you even have them. Um, I don't even have them anymore, especially, um, and people should not put them out in the summer because that's when rodents, you know, in the warmer months, the birds really only need it in the winter anyway. Keep the dogs out of the woods and widen your trails. And if needed, use a least toxic pesticide barrier treatment. The state recommends a permethrin or bifenthrin product um, that a landscaper or a homeowner can do by attaching it to a hose and spraying six feet into the woods and the shady areas. It's recommended that you do one spray in May to June. And if you needed another, you do it in August and September. Because remember, in May and June, you've got the nymphs. and August, September, you've got the adults out looking for blood meals. So after talking to different landscapers, and this, I called the state, I said, OK, I'm going to try this. I got a $10 bottle of, I forget what it was, but anything that says ticks on it. And it'll tell you what the, it's a chemical. I'm a gardener, remember. But I decided I had to get my yard down to ground zero because I'd had it, it was either them or me at that point. And so I, uh, I don't usually do the spraying at my house, but uh, I had to do it that time. And I attached it to the hose and dragged that hose around, sprayed six feet, sprayed all my Pachysandra, all the shady areas. And because I was on the war path, I also got like a rat poison, which we can't find anymore. And I put it in the stone walls and things for the rodents. Well, I did that probably four or five years ago, and actually I haven't had to ever do it again. Um, so, you know, I, I'll tell you some other things I do do now. How do you know you, didn't have, you, you don't have to do it? You just haven't seen any ticks? Or yeah. You, oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't, and, um, you know, I'm out in my yard a lot now, yeah. um, so no. But I'm, you know, and I come in and check myself, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how I know. Oh. And sometimes people know from their animals, if the animals are bringing in ticks, if you have them. And actually, I didn't say something. Someone told me, because I don't have a dog or a cat anymore, but they said they were actually putting cedar oil on the dogs. Now, I don't know how greasy it is, but the ticks apparently were not even attaching. So, you know, if you have a dog, maybe it's worth trying. Um, so, but then, um, Last, um, last summer, uh, we were at my daughter's house in May for a Mother's Day get-together, and there were other people. We were sitting out in the yard, and um, there were ticks around. Remember I said, you know, we didn't have a lot of snow, but it was wet, and they liked it. And they were in the sun in her yard when I was out gardening the couple days before this. Well, a number of us had ticks crawling on us that day, and my husband and I both had one attached when we got home. So because I'm on this Middlesex Tick Task Force group, and I have a brochure back there that you can take a look at, because I think they should continue this, which they're not doing. 
um, our group of eight or ten towns, um, mostly doctors, nurses, public health people, conservation, and then there were a couple of us, just concerned citizens, that were part of it, uh, got a Chena grant, which is, there's different kinds of grants, and they did different things. They uh, built bird um, or trail markers so they could put information in there um, for people to pick up. And then we held a, um, a night of presentations. And then they um, got uh, this grant to do tick testing. So it turned out it ended up being Middlesex, Franklin, and Cape Cod counties because the, the lab person out at uh, UMass was connected with these other counties. And it was 32 towns. And if you had a tick attached to you, you could send it in for free to be tested for an Lyme, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. So we sent ours in. It was supposed to take five days. It took almost 14 um, because they were inundated, even though they had hired extra people. Um, and my husband's was negative and mine was positive. There's this thing about pheromones that's questionable. Mosquitoes like him, ticks like me, I think. This has never been proven, but a lot of people are wondering about it. Anyway, um, since my tick was positive, um, I already knew because that I was going to get an antibiotic because I was already having knee problems. I was having to walk sideways down my stairs. Um, both my knees were hurting. That's not normal for me to happen like that fast. So at that point, you know, I was able to call my primary, who by the way is not the one that was really been treating me. She didn't know anything about Lyme when I got this. She had connected me to an infectious disease doctor who, you know, had been good about treating me. But then my primary's daughter got Lyme, so she started learning a lot. And I actually take now a lot of my information to the various doctors that I go to. I don't know if they look at it all. I suggest maybe putting some of it out in the waiting area to help educate people. But I figure I'm trying. So she, she just, you know, when I told her we've had enough discussions and she's known enough now with this, she just said, okay, you know, I'll just call it in. So that's, so I had to take that again. I want you to know there's this big controversy about taking long-term antibiotics. And actually, many teenagers get this doxycycline for acne. Um, and people take long-term antibiotics for many different diseases. So if you need it and you're sick, you know, I don't know what the hullabaloo is about. Okay. So here's the tick tubes. They're 95% effective if used in May and June. And then again, you have to put out new ones usually in August and September because they have um, permethrin treated cotton balls inside. Remember, permethrin kills the ticks. So the, the mice, usually it's the mice, take this cotton back to their nest. So when the nymphs in the spring are looking for a blood meal, they rub against the permethrin, it kills them. This happens again in, the, in August, September. You put it out for the adults and you kill them before they're able to lay those eggs and start the new life cycle again. Um, it was a seven year study done on um, Fire Island in New York. Um, and the, the problem is they're a little expensive. Um, we have been able to get our health department to order them, but any nonprofit group can do that and get a discount. Um, it's usually a box of uh, 12 and there's 24. I brought a box just to show you what they are, but it's biodegradable uh, cardboard, almost like your toilet paper roll. Some people are telling me they're just going to use those and spray permethrin on that cotton. Um, the permethrin that you buy to spray is usually only about 2.2 percent. The um, when you get the tick tubes, it tells you on the box it's about 7 percent, so it's stronger but apparently it's working. And that person from the Cape, you know, that, that told me there was babesiosis there, he said he was taking the cotton tubes, spraying them, or not tubes, cotton. He didn't want to spend the money on them, he was young. Um, sprayed them and stuck them even in, uh, up 
under the bark of some trees and, you know, tried, you have to hide them from the animals, you know, but you can put them in wood piles and brush and pachysandra and stone walls. And, you know, there is a method to how far apart um, you want to put them, you know, or wherever you see the mice. So, the deer love hosta. Um, they apparently like Solomon seal, although they, they never bother mine in my yard, but it just depends. You know, I have finicky ones, maybe. Um, I actually don't see the deer that often. I just once in a while see deer droppings. Um, they don't really like any ferns, and boxwood they also don't usually eat, although this winter's been so bad, people have said they've been eating everything. Um, and sedums they don't usually eat either. So here's some deer and tick prevention products. Um, you can see to the right over there, the blue cover, that is a, a permethrin for clothing. Um, but there's lots of different brands. Um, you can get it at REI. My pharmacy carried it originally. Someone told me they had it, um, you know, any sports, sporting goods. And I'm sure it's more available now than it ever was. Um, of course, DEET. And then garden netting, but, uh, you know, deer can jump over eight-foot fences. So, you know. Then the Biospot is a, a permethrin or bifenthrin product. Um, then there's liquid fence. There's all kinds of different ones that are a little bit more um, natural, nature-based. And Irish Spring Soap. You're wondering what that is. Well. Somebody told me about this from our garden club a long time before I even had a problem. And uh, one day we were leaving in July, I think it was, for a week vacation. And I went out that morning and saw that um, they were eating lilies, something was eating lilies by my mailbox. Well, you know, they're tall. So I figured it had to be the deer. So I remembered about the Irish spring soap. I said, oh my gosh, we can't go away for a whole week. They'll eat them all while we're gone. So I took out some uh, wooden dowels. My husband cut the soap in twos or threes. I forget how big it was. Put a little hole in it, and I put the soap right on the, the dowel. And lo and behold, we came back a week later, and not one more had been eaten. And I find that apparently they don't like the smell. So what you want to do is change their pathway so they don't come in your yard. So now. I take and I put them on the dowels in the back of my property. I, I have no rhyme or reason how I space them except where I think they're coming through. And sometimes, you know, you, as soon as it, you can stick something in the ground, I'll replace mine. But I leave it up all year because it works even in the winter a little bit because most of these other things you spray, the rain and the snow washes it off. So, you know, and then sometimes I put it right by my hosta. And, you know, it's not as beautiful as it could be, but I don't care. At least they're not eating it, and I can enjoy it. So try it. Uh, and I was doing a talk uh, at our senior center once, and my neighbor had come to it. And I said, so I want to change the pathway. They can go to your neighbor's yard. <laughs> she doesn't really garden, though, and they don't have anything, so she doesn't care. But she laughed. So these are just some handouts that we have. And this was the Lyme disease uh, report that um, was issued in Massachusetts in 2013. Um, so they can um, take a look at this disease a little more. And we know it needs it. So some of the controversy, I already said that the tests are only about 50% accurate um, and that the Infectious Disease Society still says that chronic Lyme doesn't exist. Um, the, um, I should just say about the test, they're like 30 years old. No one has come up, um, they haven't come up with another test that they, um, that's any better. Um, so the, um, the IDSA, apparently uh, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia kind of became named diseases around the time that they started to see more chronic Lyme. I don't know. Um, there has been peer-reviewed evidence-based research published in New England Journal and other journals that chronic Lyme does exist. 
And until the guidelines are changed, it will be an uphill battle for many of us to get um, proper treatment and medical coverage because people who have chronic Lyme and are not able to get um, treatment or their doctors are pressured not to treat for chronic Lyme because remember, if the IDSA says there's no chronic Lyme, your insurance companies don't have to pay for it. So many people are paying out of pocket for very expensive treatments as well as supplements and things too. Um, so ILADS has just released new guidelines as of 2014. Um, they're also training doctors because um, there aren't enough Lyme literate doctors to, um, to treat because even the CDC agrees that um, Lyme disease is supposed to be a clinical diagnosis and the tests are only supposed to be in conjunction with that. But now doctors really just give you the tests, you know, not that many really look at you clinically or know how, I guess. So um, it's a problem. Um, so Connecticut um, Attorney General Blumenthal in 2008 filed an antitrust suit against the Infectious Disease Society's process for writing its 2006 Lyme disease guidelines and for conflicts of interest, financial interest, in test, drug, and insurance companies. They agreed to make changes. But in February 2010, the IDSA violated their agreement. Um, they just quoted the people that worked under them and never changed any of the people, although they had agreed to this. And then uh, uh, Attorney General Blumenthal went on to become a senator. So I don't know where the court case stands at this point. Um, also, at the IDSA's annual conferences, they have excluded divergent medical evidence and opinion. Sharing knowledge, is, I'm told, is why you have annual conventions for no matter what, what field you're looking at. And so ILADS and Lyme Disease Association have held their own conferences now for 15 years in order to, um, you know, have more information out there. Um, and this was another similar situation to what occurred with HIV AIDS. Um, and then there was, um, in 2010, Massachusetts pr um, passed a bill to protect doctors who were treating with long-term antibiotics for chronic Lyme. Now you'd think, why on earth do we have to pass a bill? Well, these doctors were being pressured not to treat. And in some states, people were losing their license. Um, that's how serious it had gotten. The IDSA is a very powerful um, organization. And so most of the New England states have passed this. New York just passed it finally um, in December of last year. Uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin have it, and California. Um, Right now, um, the, uh, there's uh, a bill in the House. It's not 989 anymore. It was last year. And this is to um, mandate medical coverage for um, chronic disease, especially Lyme. Um, it went all the way up to a month before um, the end of the year. And then the lobbyists stopped started in and it, it, it dropped. It was reintroduced again in January. There are many um, House members that are supporting it initially. I don't know if they have no people who are sick because this is becoming so prevalent now or how that's working, um, but it has a lot of push behind it right from the start um, so that um, people don't have to always pay everything out of pocket. And the Finance Committee actually did a study and said that it would only cost about 13 cents more per person uh, to, to do this. Um, right now, the cost to society for treating Lyme disease um, for meds, hospitalization, disability, loss of work time, they're estimating at $1.3 billion a year. 
And the, uh, and I should just tell you, Representative Linsky is in the House at 469. Turns out I just read that his son um, had, um, had severe uh, chronic Lyme when he was in college. Uh, and Senator Ann Gobi, and that one in the Senate is 985. And then the federal house bill, there, I guess there's been a bill in the federal level for 20 years and nothing's happened to it. Um, but last year, um, they, the house actually passed um, this bill, 4701, and it requires the government to perform and support research on Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. It was passed last September, 2014 in the house. It still has to go to the Senate. Um, it's called the Tick-Borne Disease Research Accountability and Transparency Act of 2014. You can actually Google them um, if you're interested in reading about it or, um, or even um, letting people know that if they want to let um, their representatives in Massachusetts know that you're concerned about having that passed, get in touch with them. I've never done anything like this before, but you can tell I'm a little involved now. Um, so, this was an article in Time about how wildlife in the U.S. needs stronger management. And when I saw this, I said, oh, I have to look at it. They're not only just talking about deer, they're talking about, you know, years ago after we did a lot of hunting, uh, we kind of wiped out a lot of the, or got close to wiping out a lot of species. So they wanted to protect them. So that's what they did. They instituted, um, uh, you know, a lot of, um, rules about you can't hunt or you can't go after these animals. Well now they didn't um, have any kind of management around them. They just let them proliferate. And so, you know, I kind of call it the perfect storm um, at this point where we need to um, have some kind of management. And of course I think they put the deer on here because they talked about Bambi. And a lot of people, you know, we all think they're beautiful animals. Um, but if they're not managed at a reasonable level, and we have to live with these, these animals and all be safe, um, that was the point of it. So um, this was this Middlesex Tick Task Force group that I talked about already. Um, and uh, we had a woman from Dover, uh, from the Board of Health, she was the director there, came to speak to our group because we had a woman from Weston uh, Conservation who was actually on our group. And both those towns eventually started a deer management program. And, but the woman uh, from Dover, she was terrific. She got right in there. She said, somebody came, well now I have 10 years, but it would be probably almost 14 years ago now, came to a Board of Health meeting and said, what are you doing about ticks, lime, and deer? And she said, we knew nothing about it. So she said, we sent a survey to the physicians and hospitals to understand the reporting frequencies. Of course, they only got 42%, but that wasn't bad. 26% um, didn't report at all. It's, you know, they have a lot to do, so it's difficult. Um, they didn't have to put their names on the papers either. They checked the tick density by dragging sheets along the playgrounds and checking to see how many they got. They had high school kids, um, you know, doing some of that. And they sent the ticks to Tufts for analysis um, to see what diseases they were carrying. Um, they had 20% huntable land, 80% not. So, um, of course, they also said that the deer eat 8 to 12 pounds of vegetation per day. And they leave little underbrush. So they're also worried about this because once these mature trees go, you're not going to have anything to replace them. That's what I was talking about, how the way they're eating things before. Um, and the deer increase in number two to four times over eight years without hunting. And then I talked about the number of eggs. Um, so what happens is the Board of Health interviews the people before issuing a license and the deplete police department vets them. If anyone's had a DUI, they would not get a license. They provided three licenses, one on the car, one on the person, and one on the, um, the, um, the blind. They Actually, it's only bow and arrow hunting. So they have these, um, I guess, what are they called blinds? I can't remember what they're called. Yeah, up in the trees. Yeah, 
the stands, that's what I wanted to say. Um, the stands have to face away from the trails. There are all kinds of rules that they follow. There's never been any um, accident, anyone getting uh, shot with bow and arrow in Massachusetts. They've been doing it at the Quabbin for years because the deer were eating all the sh um, shrubbery or bushes, the old, the weeds, whatever, everything around there. And so all the dirt was going into the Quabbin and ruining the quality of the water. So they have sponsored a hunting time out there for years. One of my neighbors telling me her husband has gone for years. Um, and a lot of the people who actually do the hunting in their towns are their police or fire, so they actually know a lot of them. And they actually also um, had required people to volunteer a couple of hours um, of their time during the year at some point to do things in their um, conservation lands. And it did not cost the town anything because when after they shot their deer, they had to bring them to a volunteer who would measure it and do whatever they have to do. And then it had to be reported to the um, Board of Health within a, I don't know if it's 24 hours, I forget now, but it was a short period of time. Um, because, you know, otherwise you, you know, these feeding areas and stuff, they have been illegal. You can't really set those up in, in areas um, because then, well, we just, we don't, they're illegal in Massachusetts. Um, they bring the, they set them up so they attract the deer and then the hunters have an easy time. And of course they have certain numbers they can only hunt. So um, these are some materials um, that, um, that I brought and that I have here. Oh, before I do that, I just want to tell you that um, the price of doxycycline has actually gone up tenfold in the last, I don't know if it's the last year or two, I think almost two. Um, and the horses are taking mega doses. I don't know what the reason is or if they're, they're just not able to produce enough. But um, Senator Chuck Schumer is asking the FDA to increase production of it. It went out. I mean, you couldn't get it for about yeah, eight months. Yeah, you're right. It was out of production. Right. The vets were having to use something else which was not as effective. And when it came What back, did they use? Like, Amoxicillin or no, something? No, it's like... Oh I don't know. It's, it's one I'd never even heard yeah. of. Something and, else. And, and when it came back, it was three times the price. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, I used to, I, I know I had gotten it for like $6 or something as a copay. Yeah. And this time, I don't know, the copay wasn't that high, but they, they, I don't know why, they put the regular price on my thing. Mm -hmm. I was like, I think it was two or $300. So somebody, if they don't have insurance coverage for that, they're paying that amount for it. And it used to be hardly anything. Um, I also wanted to just say that um, barbary is a um, tick magnet. In other words, ticks really go for that, and I think they're protected because it's a um, it's a invasive species. It's not a native. You've probably come across it on some of your trails. Um, it's very prevalent now because of the um, the deer eating. You know, a lot of our um, thank you indigenous and native plants and so these other things are taking over and barbary is one specific one and it's spreading like crazy How do you spell that? Is something barbary yes. no the ticks like it oh, ticks it's almost like, like a home for them oh. it's it's b-a-r-b-e-r-r-y i think barbary or it may be b-r b-a-r-y how did i spell it i think it's i don't know one or the other um Oh, and I just also wanted to say that I know the Audubon trustees have opened up their property for hunting. Tower Hill has. Um, the New England trustees have done that. And Maine Coastal Botanical Garden, I was up visiting that last year. Beautiful. Um, but they also were doing it. So they just feel they've tried everything else and they can't manage because the numbers are so great. Um, so the Lime Times here is a magazine that comes out about two to four times a year. It's published by the Lyme Disease Association, which used to be the California Lyme Disease Association, and they morphed into that. Um, they provide current information on both medical and the political issues around the, this. Um, and so 
you know, we recommend that everyone gets this in the library so that you can keep up to date. Um, actually, if you ask your library to get any materials, uh, you just say that this is epidemic and they're usually more than happy to, to order some of these things because they know we need more education. Um, cure unknown inside the Lyme epidemic, Pamela Weintraub, her whole family had Lyme disease. She's a science journalist. She's from New York State. Um, she was one of the first ones to write a book about um, the the Lyme epidemic and what was going on. It's really a very interesting read um, from sort of the start of what was happening here in Connecticut and, and what has happened since. Um, Why Can't I Get Better it was a new book that came out last uh, November. Um, it's called, um, it's written by Dr. Richard Horowitz who is a past ILADS president. He, his theory is that um, doctors are trained to look at one disease, separate things. And he feels that now with all these chronic illnesses, doctors need to be trained to look at multiple um, diseases because chronic diseases often include a lot of multiple parts um, of your system. Um, it is written for doctors and for patients alike because often patients are trying to figure out what to do and where to go. Um, it's complicated, but it's good. Um, Beating Lime was um, also one of the first ones I read, and actually somebody stole it at the Boston Flower Show one night at the, at the opening party. I thought I could leave it there all night, you know. They had to pay $100 for a ticket. They didn't really need my book. But it was written by a woman in Wayland who actually had chronic Lyme before we were talking much about it, and it's her story about um, what happened to her, and one of the things was how she had to fight the medical community. She went to, uh, she had to go to the hospital. She was having a, a Herx, which is sometimes, they call it a Jerex Herxheimer. Sometimes when you're taking medication, the bacteria doesn't like it when you're doing it. So you're having a, uh, sometimes feel worse than you did before you took it. Um, and so they often have to either cut back a little on the medication, you know, figure out how to give it to you. But um, she got to the hospital, and she, of course she didn't take her medicine with her, and she'd finally gotten diagnosed and, you know, and was taking something. And, uh, she, uh, and she knew the doctor. It was a friend of the family. Um, but he wouldn't let her go home and get her medication. So I guess she decided she was going to, she called a friend and she snuck out the front door and said to her friend, drive me home, let me get my medicine, and then I'll come back. Because they told her if she left that she wouldn't have any insurance coverage. So that's what she did. She came back. She said nobody talked to her until they um, dismissed her the next day. <laughs> but she got her treatment that she, she felt she needed. Um, these are some other books, Lyme, Coping with Lyme Disease, The Lyme Diet. Often people have to go off all sugars because you get um, yeast infections with, um, with um, um, antibiotics. Um, and the the bacteria is like sugar, so they multiply. Um, insights into Lyme disease treatment, and here's recipes for repair. Um, everything you needed to know about Lyme disease, the Lyme disease solution, healing Lyme, the Lyme disease survival guide, and this Lab 257 I read last year, uh, it's a, it is a crazy story, but, and the, but there's a lot of proof that it may be true, but they're thinking that um, this lab after World War II, I don't know, maybe it's after the uh, Vietnam, I forget now, but anyway, they started up this, uh, this, uh, on this island off New York, and they had a lab and the government was running it and, you know, was built and it was wonderful. They kept all these bacteria, terrorist kinds of things they had in there and they were keeping them all under control. And then after a while, the government didn't want it anymore, so they sold it to a private company, and they didn't really keep up the facility, and they think that some of these things have been escaping. Read it. You can't believe it. I hope it's not true, but I think it is. Um, I just wanted to say too, like I've taken copies of different things to, uh, I've gone to the vets in town, the police, fire, you know, uh, they're all out in the woods with, uh, with those ticks. Um, so this is um, 
Joseph Boroscano was one of the first um, people um, that I had read some stuff on. He has come up with um, many different editions of ways to treat. He treated in New York State for 15 years, or 25 years, Lyme patients. And now he's, um, he's working on uh, uh, trying to get the, the governments to um, make changes and, and various things. I think he was also an Exile Ads president. Here's the film, Under Our Skin. You can, did I say you can get it on demand, hulu.com for free or Netflix? Um, and I have, these are different links and the books. I have a handout with the books on one side and some links on the other side. Tick and Counter is um, uh, Tom Mather down at University of Rhode Island who does a lot of research um, with uh, ticks. And then the, um, the Yahoo group down at the bottom. I didn't get on this for a long time because I knew I'd be inundated with emails, but I have found it interesting because someone sends um, a lot of the current research that's published in journals, and then there's other people looking for advice and things, but you put in your state, so ours would be you have to write out Massachusetts Lyme at yahoogroups.com, but you can substitute any state if you have to look up things. Um, so what you can do to increase uh, Lyme disease awareness in your community. May is Lyme Awareness Month. Um, I usually take our exhibit to our plant sale. I wear the green ribbon. I pass it out to all our garden club members who wear them that day. And we used to pass them out to any town member who maybe wanted to wear it. Um, we just want people talking about this so that they don't get sick. Um, we've asked the library to order materials. We've asked the health ed, uh, department for more education. And we're working with schools and medical personnel to inform parents and children. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't think our schools are doing near enough. I'm working with a nurse for the elementary schools, but I haven't been into the high school or junior high yet. And I don't even see forms. Some schools they send home for elementary um, field trip forms, you know, to dress properly. But I'll tell you, last spring, our high school has a um, volunteer, the kids volunteer to do work one day. And they were all in the, the woods. I was driving by at 9 o'clock in the morning and in shorts and short sleeve shirts. And I, di I just died. I went by. I turned around. I did a U-turn. I got out. I went across the main street. And I said, don't you know there are ticks in here? <laughs> and one kid said, yeah, I've just been taking them off of me. I said, do you know how serious this is? And then the man that was, who I knew, but I didn't see him, he was way back in, he came out and he says, I did give them the talk this morning, but I said they need to have it before they get dressed in the morning so they know how they're supposed to dress. They don't know anything about it, these, you know, most of these kids. So, I thank you very much for listening. I know I've given you a lot of information to think about, but this is a serious disease. It's a public health issue, huge. And um, I just want you to be safe. So. It's pretty high. That's no, about 20 percent. So you most do not have. I'm Dr. Faze. And then Actually, uh, on the Board of Health, Paul Fazinski is here too, so your local Board of Health. And I actually, and I was on the, on the commission, the Governor's Commission, the name listed on, on the board here. So we actually do have expertise here, right here in South Carolina. Uh, so it's about 20%. Uh, and what I'd like to emphasize is the prevention does work. Yeah, there's a lot of this controversy. If you forget about, forget about the controversy, but prevent Lyme disease. That would be the first thing that does work, because 20% of the ticks uh, have it, 8% don't. Uh, and if you can get the tick off within 24 hours, 36 hours, you're not going to get the disease. So, uh, even if they just do you know that for sure? Well, this is this is this this does work if you can do that. It, but the trouble is you don't often see them, as you said. The, the nymphs are very small, so they are hard to see. So the prevention with clothing and uh, tuck your pants in, uh, the permethrin spray to lower extremities at least, spray your hat. Uh, wear some gloves, spray your gloves. Just take everything and put it in the dryer. Put it in the dryer. Yeah. So you can use prevention and it does work. And you can go out in the country and you can take walks. And uh, I, I, I think that's, you know, we don't want to just be afraid of 
nature and afraid of our environment. So I think with careful attention to prevention for yourself, your, your pets, your children, uh, you can walk in our, our paths, our many paths and so forth and around town. Thank you. Yeah. You said some insurance companies don't cover for Lyme disease. How would you know, say it's not a ticket in insurance company, whether they actually cover it or not? Do you just call them up and ask them? Or? Well, they, they will cover regular testing, the ELISA and the Western blot. I, I think all of them will. Um, it's when you have to have more treatment for chronic Lyme. But how would you know which ones cover it and which ones don't? Cover chronic Lyme? Yeah. If you're going to a Lyme literate doctor, most of them will no longer take insurance from you. Really? Yes, because it all started because they were being pressured not to treat. So at what point does it morph from just, okay, here's a prescription of Dr. Cycling to dialysis chronic? How do they make that turn? Your symptoms. This is not resolving. And then you might need to get tested for co-infections because when you do these tested tests, it's only testing for Lyme disease. It's not testing for the other diseases. So if somebody still has more symptoms, then you need to go and say, I need to be tested more. Yeah? My doctor said that the, that the deer ticks don't necessarily burrow in. They would just feed for a while and then drop off, even if you, you know you had one. So right. everybody mentioned looking for ticks, but yeah. looking in that, even though you But if you're looking every day, then you might see them. You know, if you're not checking, then you're letting that tick stay on you if you don't feel it. So how long do they stay on? Until they've had enough blood. They could be on for five days. I know it wasn't anything like five days for me. I mean, I'm getting the impression that a few hours or something like that. And you were sick. Well, I got the head the whole thing. Yeah. Thing there. Yeah. And I never found a tick. Yeah. Um, we've heard that if you have a bullseye, you've got an infection. But remember, only 50% of the time you have a bullseye. You know, and you know that's why it's so hard to know if you're if you're set. Um, yeah. Um, this is a, a much lighter question. Yeah. <laughs> you know how you, you said Irish spring <coughs> work as a soap. Yeah. I had heard zest. Did zest work as well? <laughs> <laughs> it's light. I don't know, but I was somebody else had said that, and I thought, well, I wasn't sure if, if Irish Spring was still working at one point, but then I put it out again. I think I got it out late, so I had deer in my yard again, um, and I thought I might try this next because somebody else had mentioned it. So I don't know. I know Irish Spring works. And then I had an, another question: Is you've been met, mentioning the I'm not sure I'll pronounce it, the Corethrin. Mm -hmm. um, when I lived in Rhode Island, they definitely treated, I had my lawn, my wooded area and lawn sprayed with Talstar. And that was the people, they were trained at the University of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And when I moved. I've heard of that one, but I actually don't know that much about it. It's a chemical one. And yes, they yeah. walked around with gigantic hoses right. from like big trucks yeah. carrying liquid and they sprayed yeah. and, yeah. and um, that it seemed to be effective. And then I was nervous, I moved here and every company I talked to, because I have young grandsons and I have woods and yeah. I definitely have deer because they sometimes are sleeping in my yard right. and walking around. Yeah, you don't want them in your yard. They're so you're making me think of two things. One is, I'll just tell you, Rhode Island, because uh, I forgot to say this before, Rhode Island uh, passed a mandatory um, health coverage in 2003. They're the only state in the U.S. that has passed it. Then, with the deer, uh, I meant to say last, uh, so the, the, the year that we were bitten at my daughter's yard, uh, she didn't want to spray permethrin. She's got three little kids. So she, I don't know, they just went to Lowe's or Home Depot. They got something called EcoSmart, and they decided they were going to use that. I called the company. Um, it's supposed to be FDA food grade level, which, and it's mostly oils. And the insect, the ticks apparently take it in somehow in a way that we would not. So we wouldn't absorb it at all. She sprayed, and it says, it either said to spray every four or six weeks. She sprayed twice, that was it. And remember, she had a lot of ticks. So I'm telling you, if I have to do it again, I'm gonna try it. I actually think I brought a bottle of it here. Uh, I asked her to save me an empty one, but I had to go buy one because they threw it out. But um, it worked really well, and they didn't see ticks on them again. And I'm over there a lot, I babysit sometimes so um, I would suggest trying that one 
if you don't want to use a uh, chemical.